Tonight, we're in Harpenden. Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, Robert Buckland, a barrister elected to Westminster in 2010, a former prisons minister and solicitor general for England and Wales, now the government's justice secretary. Labour MP Stella Creasy, elected in 2010, a shadow minister under Ed Miliband. As a backbencher, she's led campaigns on payday loans and abortion rights in Northern Ireland. Former energy secretary in David Cameron's coalition government, he's acting co-leader of the Liberal Democrats, and rumoured to be running for the leadership, perhaps he'll tell us tonight, Ed Davey. Rachel Shabby, author and journalist who specialises in political commentary and the Middle East, and an actor who appeared alongside Scarlett Johansson in the film Under the Skin, award-winning TV presenter and disabilities campaigner Adam Pearson. to the panel, to the audience here, and of course to you at home. Do join in the conversation at BBC QT on social media. We'd love to hear what you've got to say. Let's kick off with our first question, which is from Georgina Jones. Good evening. Is stopping the automatic early release of terrorists enough, or is it just postponing the problem? Well, we've been talking about this all this week since the attack in South London. Stella Creasy. I, I fear that you have a point, Georgina, actually, because I think one of the things that all of us are worried about is there is a ticking time bomb here. It's not a lot of people, and we need to keep that in proportion. And one of the things that I find very frustrating about the situation we're in right now is that we've known about this for some time. In 2016, an independent review showed that there was a, a problem in our prisons with people who had been radicalised, and we need to be clear that it's not just Islamic radicalisation, there's far-right radicalisation as well, expressed very real concerns that our prison service wasn't able to cope. And it's now 2020, and we're suddenly faced with the idea of emergency legislation. We need to disrupt the behaviours and tactics that mean that people become radicalised. That's the thing that's going to keep us safe on our streets, as well as deal with those people in our prisons. And I really think it's important we talk about the sentences as well, because there are the people who've been convicted of terrorism offences, and some of those are what you might call low-level terrorism offences. So actually, their sentences aren't very long, but there's also people who go into prison for other offences who then become radicalised in prison as well. And we need to be able to deal with all of these issues. And I, I just worry, uh, Robert, I mean, it's really frightening for all of us to be in a position where we're trying to make legislation on the hoof to deal with such serious issues when we've had the evidence about what needs to be done, when we've had 40% cuts in the Ministry of Justice on the people who are trying to deal with these problems, and when actually the work that needs to go on within communities to also stop these problems in the first place has been cut as well. So there will be this legislation about automatic release, and I think, you know, frankly, the idea that it's about having a fight with the judges is a bit of a red herring. You need to have a fight with the Treasury if we're really going to crack this, because you can't do public safety on the cheap. Actually, Robert Buckland, why has this? Why are you in a position of, of having emergency legislation? You've been in power for ten years. You yourself, you've been Solicitor General, you've been Prisons Minister, now you're Justice Secretary. Since 2014, you've been holding those posts. I mean, the reason you've got people like Sudesh Shaman have been able to come out on the street is because you haven't changed the law to stop it. Well, in all that time, that's not quite right because the law has evolved over the past few years, and there are sentences out there extended determinate sentences where if a judge says an offender is dangerous and the parole board is involved what has happened here is that there is a group of offenders who are subject to automatic early release that was a provision that was uh, put in back in 05 uh, and it therefore applies to a large number of offenses now it's as stella says it's a small group of people but uh, i can't take any risks uh, with public safety. But you've known about the why, risk they pose yeah, to public but, safety for years. But, but, and why haven't you done anything uh, about it well, till we, now? But we have, because while Stella's right to talk about the review that was done in 2016, there has been an immense amount of work that's been done in our prisons with not just my department, not just the Home Office, but the security services, the police, all working together, embedded in our prisons. Hasn't stopped addressing, it, though, has it, Robert? Well, I'll say this. This is a very complex cohort. We are dealing with people who have resorted to this behaviour for a myriad of reasons. There are some 
who are genuinely ideological and who harbour deep-seated hatreds, who can be superficially compliant, but who then turn uh, on those who try to help them. There are others, I think, that are capable of rehabilitation, just as other types of criminal in the, in, in, criminals in the criminal justice process uh, uh, can be rehabilitated. But make no mistake, this isn't easy work. Uh, night and day, there is concentrated and coordinated uh, activity by uh, all the agencies to deal with the problem. And other countries come to us to learn from the experience we have had uh, and to apply those uh, uh, rules and, and practices in their own countries. So it's not a case of us having done nothing. We are working as hard as we can to deal with this problem. But as I've said, I cannot risk uh, any uh, 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 chance here that this sort of atrocity can be repeated, hence the need for this emergency legislation next week. Uh, Ed? Well, I agree with Georgina and I agree with Stella. Um, this is just kicking the can down the road. It may well be we need to get rid of early automatic early release. I think I agree with that. But what happens when they are eventually released? And we've got to use the time that they're in custody to have really effective de-radicalisation programmes, really effective rehabilitation programmes. Now, the government says it's doing that, but it's not. There are terrorist prisoners who are actually on waiting list to get this, these programmes, and they're actually let out before they've even got to the programmes, because the government have cut the resources appallingly. And Seller's right. There are some people who go into prison and they're radicalised even more because of the way that our prison systems are being run. Our prison systems are really overcrowded. People are locked up for 22 hours in some cases. There are huge staff shortages. The management of the prisons, Robert, is in a shocking state, and you know that. Independent report after independent report shows that. And you are not going to deal with this problem unless you sort out the way the prisons are managed and you get in early. Okay. Isn't this just an example of how politicians have been distracted by Brexit over the last three to four years and haven't concentrated on what's happened domestically? Man here in the front. Surely those convicted of terrorism in prison should be kept separate from other prisoners to avoid being radicalised. Okay. And the woman there at the back. Early release, shouldn't we do it for other violent criminals and not just people who are accused of terrorism offences? Oh, it's extended to True. other people as well. Yes, the woman here in the front. Um, to Stella's point about arguing with the Treasurer, aren't we throwing an awful lot of money after uh, a lot of bad, uh, I suppose, initiatives? And why aren't we looking to see how the initiatives that have tried and tested and failed why aren't we looking to see what's working and what's not? Well, that's a really good point, because one of the another failings of the uh, Justice Department, I'm sorry, uh, Robert, but you're on the hockey here, the, the, one of the real big failures is they haven't done those evaluations. Mm. So there are a whole set of different approaches to de-radicalisation. We need to know what best practice is to keep the public safe. That's not right. And, and, and you are not that's putting not right. enough resources Ed, into that. that. I'm sorry, that is not right. We are constantly evaluating the programmes we use because the threat shifts and it changes so far uh, as sellers mentioned far right extremism absolutely correct but it evolves and therefore uh, we are we are trying to be as fleet as foot as possible so what to has happened to the, to the review of prevent robert for example well, which is the which is the the, the, the they didn't policy put in, the policy put in uh, place to try and deter people from doing this in the first place well, in the first place when are we going to see that review well we're working on a number of reviews at the moment but that including one in particular. prevent which uh, you know frankly if we're not constantly reviewing the program then i think we're failing in our duty and not just prevent it's also the uh, the protection agencies the multi-agency reviews we've got to get those right I've ordered a review into that uh, but of course I can order myriads of reviews the reality is that we're dealing with a particularly complex group of people the issue of separation was raised, a very important point now in some cases that can work very well but there is a danger that if we put all the extremists in one unit, we are creating a college of extremism. No, sorry, sorry, Robert, and therefore, Robert, you one have... has to take a very modulated Robert, approach and look at each individual units. as a special case. You yes, have we specialist do. units yes, we for these do. people, and they're empty. No, no, they're not empty. Yes, we they, are. they are. They are un... We have... No, they're not empty. Resources in. Not true. 
Uh, this point about resources... Hang on. Are they, they empty account... or aren't they? No, they are not. They, they, there are a number of individuals in the separation units. We have spare okay. capacity, but we don't just shove people in there for convenience. We have to look at each case to make sure it's the right thing to do. But, okay. Look, Robert, I mean, I know this government doesn't like experts very much, but the fact is that you haven't listened to any experts across the field, whether it's in the criminal justice system or whether it's people with expertise in um, counter-extremism and counter-radicalisation. And chief among them, I have to say, listen, you talk about, um, you know, not wanting to take risks. You're the risk. This government is the risk. You know, we've looked at... Really? <laughs> we've looked... Really? We've seen 40% cuts to the poli uh, prison and criminal justice system, cuts to prison services, cuts to prison officers, cuts to prisons, uh, per policemen, cuts to legal aid, cuts to the Crown, C Crown C Prosecution Service. What did you think would happen when you savaged the system to that extent? So, of course, you know, this, pro this is a problem of funding and, and it is expensive. Law and order, public safety costs money. You have to be willing to invest in it. And clearly this government is not. OK, Adam. <laughs> I, I agree with everything that has been said, and I think it feeds into the, the gentleman's point that we've all been distracted for the past three and a half years, and everything else appears just completely flown off the radar, and I'm afraid now it's coming back to bite, and it's biting incredibly hard. And when, when it comes to the idea of countering um, extremism, and I think if you're doing it in prison, the horse has already bolted, and we need to deal with it at the really early embryonic stages, and find out how are these people being radicalised on the outside mm. and, and deal with that, what's causing it, what are the social factors and speak to those as well. Because the, people just get more radicalised in prisons, they don't help, it makes it worse and if you leave them in prisons longer, they're just going to have more time to be radicalised. And I think we've got the, heart, the horse and the cart the complete wrong way round with prison rehabilitation. Yes, the woman there. Yes, a lot of these children grow up with, with a diet in their childhood of hatred. So I'm just thinking, what are, what are our values? What are you trying to teach them? Just equality and tolerance? Or is there something much deeper? Like the opposite of hatred is love, faithfulness, justice, integrity, what's right. What are your values? What values do you want to teach these children who've had a diet of hatred, probably quite a lot of their childhood. Yes, I mean, in fact, because we don't know that about them all, what kind of childhood they've had or whether they've had a diet of, of hatred or not, but I, I take your point. Yes, the woman there. Hi, um, so I want to ask, really, what, what, what makes people feel disenfranchised in the first place, which means, which, you know, which means, you know, before they even get to the prisons, before that even happens. I mean, it used to be, under Labour, that they had community, in, in communities where this might be a problem, um, they used to have community officers that would come and talk to people and it within the policing and that's gone and and so now we've got the far right happening and you've got to wonder what why that's suddenly rising again and it's you know it's just the cuts really i think so yeah the man in the in the blue shirt there convicted terrorists have alienated themselves from civilized society they are rightly in prison i agree with the initiative that has been taken that they serve their full term. But at the very least, um, the society must be satisfied that before they're let out on the streets, a full risk assessment has been made that they are able and capable to come on the streets without being a risk to the public. Right. Let me take one more before I move on. Yes, the man at the back in the glasses. Yes, you, sir. Yeah, I'd like to say there are three, do the panel feel there are three contributory factors one, the increased mental health that goes on in prison. Two, the disproportionate number of ethnic minorities, people that are in prison, and the severe cuts within the services, especially up north in England, which have been impoverished for so long. When will this government wake up? Do they not have a conscience? All right, okay, I'm gonna take one more yes from the lady here. Yes, the woman there. I support the, the stopping the early, early release, but I'm, I don't have confidence about the de-radicalisation programmes, and so for me, it's not enough. I'd, you know, I think they should stay there, personally. 
So, Georgina, you were asking whether or not you know, this was just a postponing the inevitable. So you think, well, they should just be locked up indefinitely, these people? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, probably it is, yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if someone's planning to take someone's life, then I think they lose their right to having a free living life. Let me just ask one thing, if I'm wrong, because you've been getting a bit of a battering from yours, but I just want to ask a serious question. There's, we, we know that there's one uh, person who's in prison at the moment whose release is coming up in a number of, of, of weeks, in three weeks' time, uh, and you're trying to get this emergency legislation through to stop him coming out. If, if you succeed... By my calculation, he'll be in prison probably until about this time next year. So then, then what happens well, then? This is the question. And the sentencing process obviously is confined to the sentence passed by the judge. And that might be an element of custody and then release on licence. We think the parole board should be involved to do the risk assessment. But there is a longer term issue. And if you remember, we had the big debate about, do you remember, control orders, the T-PIMs that were introduced by when Ed and I were in government together. Um, big arguments about whether that is right, bearing in mind there is no conviction, no offence to uh, attach those orders to. The management of extremism in the community is something I think we're going to have to grasp now. Uh, and we've tried in the past with indeterminate sentences for public protection, which I don't think worked, because I think the judgments that we asked judges to make were rather, frankly, crude uh, and have resulted, frankly, in injustices. And therefore, I think what we need to do is calmly revisit that concept, but develop it in a way, as we have done with mental health issues, actually, and the way in which we uh, deal with people with a mental health problem in the criminal justice system and work out a system where we can assess risk, protect the public, but also balance that against the, the rule of law uh, and those due process uh, issues that do matter and make us a civilised society, make us better than the terrorists, make us different uh, and mean that we have something that is worth defending against people who seek to divide us, murder us, or injurious. Okay, Robert, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on a minute because we had a lot of questions on, on a whole variety of subjects. I'm going to try and get through as many as I can, but I just want to say uh, where we'll be next week, which is Dundee, and we'll be joined by the crime writer Val McDermott, and the following week we'll be in Weymouth with the chairman of the Royal Bank of Scotland, Howard Davis, and political commentator, train enthusiast, and former Tory cabinet secretary, uh, Michael Portillo. So if you want to be in the audience, uh, call 0330 or you can go to the Question Time website and, and follow the instructions there. Do come along if you're in the area for either of those programmes. Right, let's move on. As I say, a lot of topics I want to try and get through. Daniel War. The announcement this week that fossil fuel cars <coughs> will be banned in 2035 what is the government going to do to incentivise us, us to change cars? Right. Well, Robert, I also want to ask you about that, but I've, we, we've had you speaking a lot, so I'm just going to go around the panel for, for a, a minute. Um, Ed, what do you think should be done to incentivise us to buy cars, electric cars? Well, I want to make sure they're a lot cheaper, and that's why the government's actually not being ambitious enough. Uh, Liberal Democrats want that ban to take place from 2030, <coughs> like many other countries if you look at what's happening in Netherlands, in Sweden, in Denmark, in Ireland, and Germany are all looking at 2030. Norway's actually gone for 2025. Yes, but they've got so a, a, a lot more electric cars than we have at the moment. Yes, because they've actually incentivised things. But the point I'm making is we need to get these manufacturers to produce the electric cars and the ultra-low emission vehicles much cheaper. And if we give them that earlier timetable, as other countries are doing, they'll all be forced to produce them on the mass scale that will mean there's much greater choice and the price will come down. When I was Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, we did that with offshore wind. We helped create an industry by bringing factories to Hull, uh, which created huge amounts of green jobs, but it also helped build the supply chain to make it more competitive, and we saw the cost of offshore wind come down dramatically, so we've got a lot more green power. We need to do those sorts of systems in transport so you can be uh, driving much cheaper, cleaner vehicles. Uh, Daniel, what would you like to see happen? Um, well, basically, I, I don't think we've got the infrastructure at all for it. I think it's... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it's unachievable, because in, in come 20, uh, the 1st of January um, 2036, you're still going to be able to drive your petrol car. They're not going to stop you going to a petrol station. So it's going to make no difference to climate change. This is all about new cars, isn't it? That's right. It's about new yeah. cars. And people can't afford to buy the new cars because they are so expensive. They're so much more expensive than, than 
your, your standard diesel petrol cars. Can, 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 can I reassure well, uh, Daniel? Because briefly, a, a, a Ed, lot of want to let other people be, on the panel talk as well. Will be able to be uh, charged overnight at your own home using much cheaper overnight electricity. So in many ways, we can we can do well, it. Where's the cheaper uh, electricity going to come from? Buying, you're talking about the cost of just buying the yes, car. Yes, yeah, right. so Where's the cheaper electricity policy? The thing, the thing is that, I mean, this is just tinkering around the edges, isn't it? Um, you know, we're looking at climate crisis is the most urgent and pressing issue of our time. We don't have long to deal with it. And the kind of changes that we're talking about, um, you're asking about how we can incentivize people. Well, we do need to do that. And that needs state intervention. Um, it needs state-directed policy uh, to make it easier in all kinds of ways for people to make greener choices. And I think that uh, the blueprint that the Labour Party came up with, the Green New Deal, is precisely that. It is a state intervention, all kinds of things. Um, it's also a jobs creation program. And whether that's like gigafactories making battery packs for electric cars or um, wind turbine factories in the northeast, or metal reprocessing plants, or carbon capture factories, whatever it is, that's the scale of what we need. And that has to be a state directed thing. We can't just expect people to switch without providing that kind of uh, level of intervention. OK. So, Robert. How are you going to incentivise people to change cars? I mean, there is at the moment a grant yes. um, uh, knocking three and a half grand off the price of a car, as I understand it. You're yeah. phasing that out next month. Yeah, but we're also introducing a, a, are you, are a billion pounds. Are you actually going to go ahead with that, phasing well, it out next month? Well, what we're doing, we're, 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 what we're changing is the availability of infrastructure and actually making sure that we have more charging points. Because no, no, I but think I'm one asking, of the... no, hang on, hang on. Yeah. The, the point Daniel was making is that these cars are very expensive. The government at the moment has a subsidy to yeah. help people buy the cars. You've just made this announcement that we're all going to have to, if we're going to buy new cars from 2035, they have to be electric. Yeah. And, and you're going ahead with phasing out the subsidy next month? Because we think there's a better way of doing it, which is actually one of the barriers, I think, a lot of people feel about uh, electric vehicles is the ease by which they can be recharged. And I think... Well, well cost is the one that it, Daniel mentioned. But, but, I think, but I think by scaling up the infrastructure, it means that more people will start to buy electric cars and with that scale of demand, then the price starts to come down. I think that's the way we're going to do this. We've got 15 years. Which no, it's, but, but, but I think that you've described, <laughs> I think you frankly respect caricaturised the government's <laughs> approach to this issue. There is plenty of intervention, direct intervention, like that is going on uh, uh, every year when it comes to the incentivisation of, the uh, of, of uh, renewables. And in fact, our record as a country, and all of us have played our part in doing this, is second to none when it comes to the move to renewable energy. The next challenge is transport, because transport is now the bulk of those carbon emissions, which is why I think it's right that we brought forward that target. And I think that by scaling up the infrastructure, we will start to see that change, not just to battery, but to hydrogen, to a range of different sources of renewable energy, which I think is a much more sustainable way of going forward. You know, we could be ambitious and, and bring forward the target even more, but we have to get the balance right. We have to respect the fact that there are people out there who need to have that financial access to these vehicles. And I believe that the, the proposals that we've come up with strike the appropriate balance. But just so I'm clear, because there's been talk about the fact that the, even though this grant is it was going to be scrapped, it might be reintroduced in the budget, but that's not going to happen. The, the but, subsidy for buying electric cars, given your announcement, we're all going to be needed to be buying them, but that subsidy is going. Well, I don't know what... I, I can't judge what's going to happen in the budget. It, that, that's that's my, my colleague, the Chancellor. Okay. But what I can say is that I think it's through infrastructure improvements that we really start to see the scaling up of, of, of uh, electric vehicles. Adam. It's, it's one thing saying all, all this, but we, we, the, the general right, we, we don't have the infrastructure. And saying, oh, you can charge your, your car at home, your electric car home, really easily. I can charge most of my mobile electric <laughs> devices at home really easily. The fact is, eventually, the battery runs out. And, and what then? Kind of how many charging terminals do we need for how many cars that are, that are going to be kind of on, on the road? Pushing price down is, is one thing, and a market-led approach is great. But they, they don't always work. I, I refuse to believe that companies that make electric cars are going to take a massive hit on their profit margins because the government has, has asked them 
asked them to do it. So once again, these, these are all wonderful, wonderful ideas. But where, where, where are the numbers? How many electric terminals do we need? How many electric cars do we expect to be on our roads by, by 2030? What do we expect the price to be by, by then? How accessible is it going to be for people? And is it a cheaper alternative to the traditional fossil fuel method? And if it isn't, why, why would anyone in their right mind go for it? OK, there's a lot of hands up, so let's... The woman in the glass there, let's hear some of you. As well as um, focusing on electric vehicles, surely we need to sort out public transport. Yeah. Around here, the buses have been cut. Um, there's, from the villages, sometimes <laughs> there's only one a day. Yeah. Um, the trains for out of Harpenden particularly, there are fewer trains than there were, so surely we need to focus on that as well. Yes, the woman here in the glass is at the front. Yes, you. OK. Um, I'm just wondering, I know we're all trying to move towards electric cars, but then what do we do with the batteries? Because then isn't that another environmental problem that you have to deal with? Yes. And the man there in the blue jacket. <laughs> and a very good point. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, one thing we do know is the number of trees that we need to plant, which I think is one and a half billion. And I think that we're planting about 25% of what we need at the moment. What, what can we do more there? OK, let me hear from the man in the grey jacket, yes. Um, there's lots of pressure on us as individuals um, to make changes to our lifestyles, but when will major companies and corporations be held accountable for their actions? OK, you mean in terms of polluting? Yes. Yeah. All right. uh, Stella? I mean, we have all got to move to electric cars at some <coughs> point, surely. Yeah, I mean, I mean everyone's piling into to, to the government on this, and yeah, we can talk about the subsidy mm. and the timing, but eventually this has to happen, doesn't it? Well, also, look, there's a cost to all of us of not doing this. Uh, and I speak as somebody who, probably like a lot of you, bought a diesel car, thinking I was doing the right thing. Mm. Yes, madam. Yeah, we, we both thought we were doing the right thing. We don't have time to wait. We know that the climate emergency is real and it's pressing, and we know that transport is part of it. The lady at the right, back is absolutely right. It's not just about electric cars. It's also about the fact that people have to have cars because transport in this country is so poor. You have to join the dots together. That's where good active government can get involved in this. I, I don't know if we're going to go on to talk about Glasgow and the climate change conferences. It's where you do need the leadership. And time after time, I have to be honest, this government hasn't been there because they've said, oh, we'll have this market-led approach, but they've not been active players in that market. And that's the way you make it work. We need to have a scrappage scheme for the cars because it isn't just about new cars. It is about getting the old polluting cars off the roads. But we also need those subsidies and we need to incentivise the gigafactories that make the batteries, that make the cars cheaper. Because I looked up how much it would cost for an electric car and saw the number of dots at the end of it. You know, these things are all possible, but they require planning by government to say, actually, we're not just going to wait and see what happens and hope that people can find the cash to make this happen. We're yeah, going to do this actively do because if we don't, not just the cost to our economy, but the cost to our breathing. Um, I always say to people, I represent a London constituency, and when people are concerned about environmental issues, I say to them, leave London for a couple of days, then blow your nose and realise what you're breathing in and what we have to change. We don't have time to mess around. We have to do all of this because all of us will pay the price for a government that's going to sit back and wait for you to pick up the tab. With that charming image in my... Can I just ask, <coughs> does anyone in the audience, or indeed anyone here on the panel, have an electric car? <clears throat> you do. I do. And how's it working for you? I love it, but there is... I, I live up the road, there is one charging station yeah. in all of Harpenden. Mm -hmm. And there is yeah. always yeah. a bunch of electric vehicles queuing, yeah. waiting to charge. Yeah. So it's not about scaling up the infrastructure. The infrastructure needs to be there already. There are 18,000 registered private EV owners in Hertfordshire, and you can count on just two hands the number of charges there are. So it's utterly ridiculous. My car's six years old. It's not new technology. If you bought a new car, if you bought a new diesel car, but you had to drive way out of your way to go and fill it with diesel, you wouldn't buy it. Yeah. So it's not just about the affordability. Mine was very affordable, but there is nowhere to charge it. Right. And so I there's live in the a back of flats. I don't have a driveway mm. can, to plug Can I also ask home. how many of you here are commuters? Because a lot of this is also not just about having a car or having a bus service. It's about 
where you want to travel okay. and why you want to travel and making it easier for people to work from home so that we are travelling less And if we could get our train service working properly... Oh. Right. <laughs> OK, OK. Let's not make this a free-for-all. Let me move on. I'm going to take another question from Tanya Powell-Jones. Tanya, whereabouts are you? Has impeachment helped or hindered Donald Trump's re-election campaign and should we care? Do you care, Tanya? I do care, yes. And what's your view? I think it has helped. It has helped. It kind of plays into the idea of him versus them for his <coughs> voters. And what makes you care about it? Why do you think we should care here? Because I think it probably de devalues the impeachment. I mean, that wasn't the purpose of what it was meant to be. Um, and if it can be used like this as a political tool, what does that mean kind of going forward? Mm. OK. Adam, what's your view on this? I think anything you throw at Donald Trump at this point just isn't going to stick. I think at this point he's a mud monster and just throwing more mud at him or, or make him stronger. I've got no idea how he survived impeachment. Like, none... Well, None it's the, the, the number of, of Republicans in the Senate, I think, is how he survived it. It was just a numbers game in the end, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's true. But it's just, I don't know, it's just giving him more, more press and more momentum going into the, the re-election that's happening. And it's just really baffling to me. I don't know how he got in in the first place, even. And do you think it matters to us here? Well, we're going to be negotiating with the whoever wins this 2020 election on a trade deal. And back in April, Barack Obama said it could take up to 10 years to negotiate a successful trade deal with the US. And there's been research done that on average, any country entering trade negotiations with the US on average takes five years. I mean, but Donald Trump is much more bullish about it. Yeah, exactly. So it's time. more than likely going to be more than that. Than it's like one and a half years negotiating, three and a half implementation. And so, yeah, I think it does matter. I think the, the individual in the White House that we are negotiating with, once we leave the EU properly at the end of December, absolutely matters to our country. Okay. Ed? Um, oh, oh, sorry. I'll just come to Ed, and then I'll come to you, Rachel. Um, I think it may have improved his re-election ch uh, chances, and I deeply regret that, because we should care about it, because this man in the White House is one of the biggest blocks to action on things like climate change. This man in the White House has actually, with his foreign policy, created great instability in places like North Korea and the Middle East. Um, as a progressive politician, I find his approach to, to women, to Muslims, to Mexicans quite outrageous. I hope he loses in November. I think that would be a real step forward for the world and for those of us who care about the rights of ordinary people. Do you think that's likely, then? I think it's very difficult to tell at the moment. We're still trying to see uh, who the Democrat choice for president is. I hope they choose someone who can beat Donald Trump because that's in the interest of everyone in the rest of the world. Rachel. Well, um, it might have helped him, but it was still the right thing to do. Um, you know, because he, he did abuse the power of his office and it was corrupt. So the Democrats were right to pursue it. Um, I don't think they could have ignored it. But what we saw just now, that was not a trial with the Senate, um, a trial with no witnesses and no documentation. Um, and they had John Bolton, Republican, willing to testify, saying, hey, by the way, <laughs> I want to testify. I've got something to say about this. Um, but another so, way of looking at it is that is their system, and, and they, uh, you know, they, they went along with their system, and this is the result that you well, get. Well, they went along with their system, and I think that is, that is to their shame. The fact that they were prepared to have a trial that wasn't a trial, I think everybody can see that. Everybody can see what happened there. And does it matter? Yes, of course it does. I mean, I think for, you know, people who are progressives, leftists or liberals, there, are, there aren't that many reasons to be cheerful right now, globally. And so we are all watching uh, the US election, you know, and kind of willing the Democrats to just get it together and, uh, and win this time. And the man here at the front in the purple tie. Yeah, we can say that's the system, but we're also dependent on the integrity of the individuals. Donald Trump did abuse his office in the way that he was accused of. Mitt Romney recognized that and with some integrity, 
voted for impeachment, mm. uh, and the rest of the Republicans said, in effect, yes, he may be a bully, but he's our bully. He's, our side, so he's on our side, so we're going to support him. That's what's going on. Yeah. Woman in the green dress, um, green top. <clears throat> I'm worried that our Prime Minister is beginning to resemble the man in the White House in his treatment of minorities, but also um, press freedom and how he treated journalists the other day and refused them entry into yeah. a briefing. Right. right. We've actually got to, uh, I mean, we may come on to that. I know that's the first thing a number, a number of you have talked about. Let's just stick with Donald Trump for a moment. Um, Stella, has the impeachment helped or hindered his campaign? Should we care? Yeah, I think we should care because when you normalise politics without rules, it has consequences for making it look more acceptable in other parts of the world. I mean, I, I think you're right, sir. Who would have thought a couple of years ago that Mitt Romney would appear to be a kind of progressive <laughs> hero? Uh, but he did the right thing. He said what he thought was right and he will take the consequences in the Republican, Republican movement. Um, we are in a politics right now. There are very many tactics of American politics that are being imported into British politics in terms of how people campaign, in terms of people's arguments about whether experts and expertise matter, I think we should all be worried because it is driven in America so much by money, it's not driven by democracy. And actually we're seeing that in the Democrat um, movement as well. What I worry about is that once somebody has been able essentially to get away with it once, why not do it again? And why not then in this country start saying, well, you know what, actually, if in America people don't accept having all the press there and the difficult press scrutiny, why not do that here? If it's okay to, you know, not have clarity about what you're doing with your Russian oligarchs in America, why not do that in the UK? It becomes a very slippery slope. All of us as politicians should always be slightly uncomfortable that we're being scrutinized. That is a good thing. I don't think that Donald Trump feels that tonight, and that is a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. Robert. Let's hear your view. Let's hear the government view. Wow. Well, I, I, I think I do agree with Stella about the sense of discomfort. I think that's absolutely the place that all of us need to be. And the great thing about our system is that, you know, I can't sit in an ivory tower. I have to come and answer to colleagues uh, at questions and indeed to make statements and be held accountable upon that. I think, whilst I'm not going to get into the weeds of the American campaign, I think their system is, shall we say, a rather interesting one, in that, in a genuine attempt to try and get separation of powers right, the executive power of the president does mean that he or she is rather remote, I think, from what goes on day to day uh, on the Hill. Uh, um, but what has happened in American politics is that the tradition of working across the aisle which was a huge part of the United States Senate for most of its history, has gone. We've heard about Mitt Romney. He is a, really, a real throwback to a past that is within living memory of many of us, when the great men and women of the Senate actually put their hands across the aisle and worked together for the United States of America. Now, that has vanished. And the lesson, I think, for us is this. You know, in all the partisan hurly-burly that we've had over the last few years, I think all of us need to look in the mirror as politicians here in the UK and remember that there is so much that unites us. We are all trying to get to the same goal. We might disagree about the means by which we do it, but we are and should be men and women of honour and, yes, trust. Now, that's been a really difficult thing for a lot of people recently. And that sense of discomfort <laughs> is what I think we need to hold on to uh, as we uh, learn the lessons of some of the extreme politics that we're seeing, not just in the USA, but, so do you but feel also that, closer to do home. Do you feel that sense of discomfort in terms of doing a deal with Donald Trump then? Do you feel well, well, there's I, some discomfort I, about what I we think, just witnessed over the, think that, today you know, with the, the impeachment? The government has shown its independence of mind on issues like Huawei. Uh, we are uh, uh, far from uh, uh, assuming the position of uh, supplicant or, or bleep No, no, I'm mind, not suggesting. I just want to see if you felt following. discomfort. That was all. Uh, look, look, you have to deal with the President of the United States, whoever they happen to be, and the office is the office. Now, okay. uh, you know, I've got my personal views, but as a representative Ooh, of the government... Oh, let's hear them. Come <laughs> on, come on. We want to hear those, don't we, ladies and gentlemen? Come on, Robert, cards on well, the table. What are your personal well, views? Do you feel any I... discomfort about Donald Trump and Boris Johnson being so... Uh, hang on, hang on. Well, look, I think, apart from the hair colour, I do not see... <laughs> 
that much uh, uh, you know communality <laughs> between a classical scholar what are you saying uh, Boris Johnson and Donald Trump have got the same Trump. hair colour I think well, Boris Johnson might have a word with uh, you about uh, that I'm sorry I, I do think that blonde. some easy <laughs> comparisons are made which actually are not borne out by the evidence. What I want to see in the United States is the Democratic Party organising its caucuses efficiently so that we know what the results are going to be and that the candidate who they produce will provide a proper uh, contest rather than something that will be uh, a, a rollover. I mean, Trump has, been, has, has confounded the rules of politics in a way that perhaps some of us, you know, I'll admit I'm a, quite a conventional sort of person in the way that I do my politics, uh, find uh, you know, difficult and challenging. But, you know, elections are elections. We have to work with whoever is democratically elected difficult in the White House. Difficult and challenging, Robert. I mean, well, where do you start with the way in which he's treated minorities, the way he treats women? What he's done... He nearly caused World War Three with Iran. That's not difficult and challenging. He abused his but, office of state and, to be able to pick on a political and, and again, rival. This isn't just bad manners. This is terrible politics and, and, and should be called out as and again, And again, our po foreign policy was distinct from that of the uh, Trump White House in that we do support the uh, nuclear deal and have done our best to try and invoke the dispute resolution mechanism because we believe when we sign treaties we believe in due process of international law so that's the united kingdom actually having a distinct okay. position from that and yet you rolled the out the red carpet for him to come to this country because we're weak in the world right now rather than strong to be okay. able to stand up to him right. and tell him when he's got things wrong and we're all demeaned by it as a result okay I think this could go on quite some time. But should we have... There's another question I want to get in, if I may, which is from Naomi Jamboretz. Have I pronounced your surname you correctly? Have, thank you. Yes. Does the panel believe that I'm appropriately dressed for this occasion? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, now, for those of you who are not sitting around Naomi, she is wearing an off-the-shoulder dress. Um, which I assume, Naomi, is a reference to, uh, to your colleague, to Tracy uh, Brady, who was wearing an off-the-shoulder dress uh, in the House of Commons and, and had quite a response, uh, not a favourable one, on social media. And the papers all, were all over it as well. I mean, I presume you think, yes. I think that I would like my daughter to be judged on the merits of what she says yeah. and not yeah. how she yeah, looks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Why are we going there with this? Well, because <laughs> Naomi asked it, that's but why. Like, say, we nearly had World War Three in Iran. We've got a climate emergency. We're talking about terrorism. Hang on. We've got to deal with Brexit. Stella, Stella, I mean, you might not like it, but if these are the questions that the, the audience asked, that's the purpose of this programme. And Naomi's asked that question, so if, let's at least it was, answer it. If it was Gok Wan challenging Tracy and what she's wearing, I think she'd be worried. But it's Piers Morgan. <laughs> I mean, come on, people. <laughs> you know, women cannot win. There was a shoulder in Parliament. Get over it. Really isn't a big deal. Stella is absolutely right. I, you know, Progressive politicians have got to stand up this nonsense we get from some of these right-wing commentators. You know, Jo Swinson, during the general election, she got more criticism about her earrings uh, than some of the things she was saying. That was completely outrageous. I think women are judged to a completely different standard from men, mm -hmm. and I think it's completely wrong. You know, what my male colleague, Tom Brake, was the first MP to wear uh, an open-neck shirt and, and, and uh, without a tie. It didn't really make a headline. Uh, and that's the way that m men are treated in different ways from women, and I think it's got to stop. Yeah, I agree. I mean, yes, because there's a serious point here, Adam, isn't there? Well, there is an absolute serious point here, mm. and I think this is what happens when we put public opinion and procedure above policy. And as you said, someone showed a bit of shoulder in, in the House of Commons. I, I don't care. Do, do I agree with what she's saying? Absolutely. Is what she's saying of merit? And is she... a Damn good MP and a woman of character. Absolutely. By all means, wear what you want. I have one of those. It's a size six. I'm glad I didn't wear it now. Because <laughs> you don't have the same thing on. <laughs> um, yes, the woman there. I, I personally think it was inappropriate. Um, for example, for this evening, we were all asked to dress smart casual. Now, were also, you? No, I didn't know yes, that. Yes, we that were. Interesting. <laughs> we were. And so I think there's a slight hypocrisy there. And if I'm looking at the ladies on the panel, you've all got, well, two of you have got jackets on and um, you've got um, a smart dress which is buttoned up to here. Um, why didn't you wear anything like Tracy Brabin? 
I mean, I didn't wear a, a, a cold shoulder top, literally, for that reason, because I get a cold shoulder. Yes. <laughs> and in fairness... <laughs> well, I think it looks great. Because in why fairness, are you asking the men why they chose some of the. Let, let, hang on, let me just make a point. Because Tracy Rabin did say she wasn't expecting to make a comment in the dispatch box, and she was actually yeah. going out that evening, so she was slightly taken by surprise. But, but nonetheless, was defending her right to wear what she liked. But that's interesting. So you, as a woman, you're not supporting her right to, to wear what, pretty much what you know what she wants. Well, I just that's, think it's irrelevant to, to, to what she says. No, I think it's important what she said, um, but I do think that there's a certain dress code. If she's um, leading, she should lead by example. And I don't think, I don't think the off-the-shoulder was appropriate because it was too much off-the-shoulder. It looked like a disco outfit and not like a politician. OK, there's quite a few women with their hands up, so let's, let's hear yeah. some more. Yes, the woman there in the glass at the back. Yes, you. Um, yes, I, it's fine for women to wear what they want, but are we now saying it's OK to tear dress code? And then if we do that, can we blame school children who breach uniform code, you know. So there's, there's not a uniform code there in the House of Commons. I know, but is there a dress sure code in the, in the House of Commons? Because if we say people can wear anything they want to wear anywhere, then that means we're tearing up the dress code anywhere. And then there shouldn't be a uniform code as well for the children. Okay. That means they're allowed to flout uniform codes in school if the adults believe they can actually flout dress codes as well. OK, I, I, can, can I, just lots of women with their hands. So let me just have a quick scout around the room. Hang just one second. Yes, the woman there with the, with the brown hair, yes. I mean, yes, yes. Oh, sorry, I can't I see what you're wearing, but I know you've got brown hair. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's so important to mention this because it just shows an overarching theme of culture that we have today where se sexual harassment is so normalised. I'm 21 and it's so unusual for me to come across someone who hasn't had to deal with some form of sexual har harassment. And I was going to mention the Pretty Little Thing ad pretty, yeah, the advert that um, got banned recently. And I, I can... Sorry, which advert are you referring to? Uh, pretty little pretty thing. Little thing. Mm. It's a clothing. Oh, it, was, it, was, it was criticised for being overly sexualised. Yeah, yeah, yes, basically. But um, I watched it, and a lot of people, um, 18 to 24, which is what it was aimed at, will be dressing like that, especially for things like um, festivals and things like that. So if people are told that it's wrong to dress like that, it normalises people um, sexual harassing people who are dressed like that. And it's really not OK... And I think people um, mentioning, sorry, I can't remember her name, but the politician that had the shoulder... Tracy um, Braben. Tracy Braben that had the shirt off the shoulder. It just shows an overarching culture that we have today. OK, all right. There's two, two women with their hands up, and then I'll come back to the panel. Yes, the woman there in the red top. Um, while women are still underrepresented in politics, is it really fair to be focusing so much on what they're wearing over what they're saying? Like, what image is that giving to young people who want to go into politics that your work's going to be undervalued based on what you're wearing? OK, yes, and the woman just behind you. Um, hi. Um, yes, as the lady further down said that Tracy's dress looked like a disco outfit, as a mother of two young girls, I very much hope that they will grow up to express themselves as they feel... And actually, I make many trips to the supermarket with my daughter dressed in her tutu, <laughs> with her leopard print onesie, and that's absolutely fine because I think, actually, dress code, yes, there has to be some sort of boundaries, but actually, people should be able to express themselves how they wish, and it shouldn't be judged at all. You just want to come in, yeah, quickly. There, well, there is actually a dress code in Parliament, but it's only for men because Parliament hasn't thought about the fact there might be women there. <laughs> Frankly, <laughs> Tracy, could have been, Tracy could have been wearing a wimple and somebody would still comment on what you're wearing. It's what we I'm do. I'm sure they would comment if she was wearing a wimple. Life. And I promise you, one of the things that I'm going to do when I get back from maternity leave, and actually what I'm wearing, madam, is a shirt so that I can breastfeed underneath the shirt. That's why I'm wearing what I'm wearing, um, is to campaign to make misogyny a hate crime alongside all the other forms of abuse that women and men get so that we treat women equally because it's a thing that's tackled street harassment when half of all young girls in this country tell us they're frightened to walk our streets we have bigger challenges to deal with than a bare shoulder in parliament or the fact that pierce morgan is offended by it. Okay. Um, i mean rachel what's interesting or what struck me anyway is, is that because I've also almost exclusively women, in fact, exclusively women for a response to this, and, and it, 
not yeah, everyone is of the same. Not tired, everyone is of the same. But yes, but not everyone is of the same <laughs> mind. So we've got at least two women here who who, who don't support the idea of Tracy well, Raven wearing a, a dress like that. That's allowed, I believe. To mm. not no, no, be exactly. I'm just, I'm just making <laughs> a point. <laughs> you know, maybe that will get banned. Who knows? Um, give it time. But uh, I think what's interesting, there was a, a woman at the back who made that point about, you know, how, how difficult, um, how underrepresented women are in politics as it is. And I, I think that's really important because this is just one more way of judging women and, you know, if young people looking at this play out and the level of criticism heaped upon a woman for her dress choices in Parliament. Mm -hmm are going to think, you know, added to the misogyny and the, har and the harassment and the, 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 the abuse that women get disproportionately, and black women most of all, yeah. Yeah. Um, you just, would just put them off getting involved. Why on earth would you want to sign up for that? So I think it's really important that we don't focus on these issues and do actually talk about policy and experience and capabilities and talent instead. OK. Well, since the question was asked, we're going to focus on it for one more person, which is Robert. Well, I was in the chamber when Tracy actually came in to make her point of order. And you know what was remarkable about it was that she's got a quite a, a nasty uh, issue with her ankle. and she, It's totally bound up at the moment. I think she might have had some surgery on it. And she hopped to the dispatch box to make her point of order because she was determined to come in and have her say, despite the fact, you know, she, her mobility was quite quite significantly restricted. And frankly, I was more interested in that than what she was wearing. She was wearing the equivalent of black tie. You know, if, if it was me, I, you know, I might, I might have come in, in, in wearing black tie if I was going on to a dinner. Really get over it, you know, move on and let's focus upon what politicians of whatever gender, whatever sex, are talking about, not what they're wearing. OK. <laughs> I'm going to get one more question in. Uh, we've just got time to do it, and it's, it's something that's been touched upon already, but there are an awful lot of questions about it, so I want to raise it quickly in the time we have left, from Stephanie uh, Russon. Stephanie. Should the Prime Minister speak to all of the press, or just the ones he likes? Right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, uh, Rachel. <laughs> um, yes, this government is quite worrying with the press, isn't it? It has a really weird relationship to the press. We saw it pop up in the general election campaign as well. Um, the government, um, aside from spreading a misinformation campaign, which is why it's so uh, weird to hear you talking about trust, Robert, um, besides that, they seem to um, not like the BBC's undue attention on um, things like a toddler uh, being forced to sleep on the floor of a hospital for lack of beds, um, to which I would suggest maybe, you know, put some money into the NHS so that you avoid having toddlers um, forced to lie on the floor. This was during the election campaign. During the election campaign, rather than getting upset when the press does its job and draws attention to the fact. Um, we also have the government, I think it's banned ministers, is it, from appearing on the Today programme yeah. because, yeah. you know, those questions aren't any good either. It's a really worrying trend. Um, you sh as Stella was saying before, you should be feeling uncomfortable. It's not supposed to be fun for you. Um, <laughs> it is so actually it your job to be scrutinised by the media and you don't get to pick and choose which of the media you want to talk to and you don't get to play this stupid performative game of antagonising the media for the sake of spectacle and as a way of distracting from your woeful policies. Well, I just want to say uh, thank you, Robert, because you are on this programme. Thank you. So <laughs> thank you for coming on and taking all the questions and taking uh, the old one from me as well. Do you want to respond to that? I mean, obviously, well, you know, Rachel's talked about the Today programme. Have you appeared on the Today programme? Um, I was asked for the Today programme, I think, during the election campaign. I did several appearances yeah, with since, uh, since Nick. Then. Uh, no, I haven't. Um, uh, look, I love the Today programme. Radio 4's been my radio channel of choice for about 30 years. I 
relish scrutiny. It's part of my job as a politician. But I do think, you know, with respect, I do think it's easy to make jibes against a politician whose views you disagree with and suggest that somehow uh, he or she is avoiding the press, when in fact what has happened over the last... Uh, you know, a few months has been unprecedented scrutiny and scrutiny that continues in Parliament every week. So the Prime Minister comes and answers questions of, of MPs of all different colours. Uh, he and his ministers are exposed to uh, scrutiny uh, on the floor of the House where everybody can, can watch out, yeah, and everybody can... In the fridge. Let, 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 him answer, the fridge. So let, let him answer, please. Look, uh, the election campaign, I, I mean, a lot of us, you know, I was in the thick of it in the election campaign, out on the media answering questions, taking stick. Uh, frankly, so was the Prime Minister. He was being interviewed many, many many times across the country by national and local and regional media. And he there refused was... to be questioned by Andrew Neil. Oh, well, so like what? Others. That was a scandal. So what? what? Was most so, what? so what? It was a general so what? election campaign. He's... Look, we ran away from I, I just think... I'm sorry. I, I just think when you look at the whole picture, the idea that somehow Boris Johnson is somebody we don't know much about and don't know his views, come on. I mean, he's probably one of the what? most scrutinised politicians in but, modern okay. history. Is there much that we don't know about Boris Johnson? I don't think so. And uh, frankly, uh, you know, my view <laughs> is that it's, oh, it's convenient, it's very convenient, I think, for people who disagree with him to suggest that he's running away. I think the opposite is the case. Mm. Um, yeah, th th it, I, it just... Yeah. To take a slightly different tack here, yeah. John Humphreys, when he left the Today programme in September, mentioned that Jeremy Corbyn hadn't been on the Today programme for three yeah. years. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, just, just to get a sense of perspective there. No, I, look, I, I think part of our job is to be in that uncomfortable position of being scrutinised and I don't think it's just about your leader, I think it's about all of us. We should try and be part of a, a healthy, vibrant democracy when you have those debates. The challenge here is it's part of a pattern. Somebody there just shouted uh, about the report into Russia. It, you know, this is a government not just trying to restrict the press coming into Downing Street, not publishing important reports into intelligence about whether there have been Russian interference in our democracy before an election. Um, when judges challenging them start to talk about changing the rules of the Supreme Court, uh, a government that then starts t floating the idea that we might get rid of the BBC as a national broadcaster, it starts to paint a picture of somebody who actually doesn't enjoy scrutiny, Robert. You know, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, there is a lot of quacking going on here, but not much actual scrutiny of what government is doing. And for us to be able to do our job, you know, I can sit in Parliament, I can ask one question, but I am just one MP. We need a healthy, vibrant press. We need an independent judiciary. It's because that independence is what enough. keeps us honest and keeps our democracy free and healthy for enough. all of us. And when that gets threatened and slowly the, the, the strings get flied away piece by piece, which is what Boris Johnson is doing, all of us will be damaged by its result. And yes, I would hold the Labour Party up and say, yes, we have to be part of that process too. We have to be accountable. Okay. But I'm not going to give Boris Johnson a free pass when he's... he's he, what he's doing now is not going on, on mainstream media, but has his own Facebook channel where he's pretending to be like Jennifer okay. Aniston, jumping out on people like she's on Friends. So, it's we're, extraordinary. We're almost out of time. <laughs> I need to get to... We've only got about a minute left. But let's hear I, from I, you I both. think um, now more than ever, politicians need to be held accountable and ask the right questions and give good solid answers. It's the time for the catchphrases and signposting is 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 been and gone. It, it's happened, we've left and and so on and so forth. And yeah, he, he does duck into it. He does get a, a free pass. And if he's only being interviewed by the people he, he likes, what does that what does that what does that say? Anyone can be even even the nastiest people can be nice to their friends. Okay. Ed, we've only got about thirty seconds left, I'm afraid. Hugely serious issue. Dominic Cummings, the Prime Minister's right-hand person, called the BBC the mortal enemy of the Conservative Party. We have got to stand up for the BBC if we do nothing else. note our hour is up thank you very much for all your questions and i know this issue about journalists came up earlier and a lot of you asked it so i just wanted to get it in quickly at the end i'm sorry i didn't have time for, for many comments from you but our time is up next week we are in dundee and the week after that we will be in weymouth so call 0330-123-9988 if you'd like to be in the audience or go to the question time website and you can follow the instructions there and if you want to carry on this discussion you can have your say on tonight's topics. You can join Adrian Charles and guests on Question Time, Extra Time. That's on Five Live right now. But it just remains for me to say thank you very much to the panel. 
Thank you very much to the audience here for coming along and asking so many questions. And thank you to you at home, of course, for watching and for listening. From Harpenden, bye-bye. Stay with us for more political debate, courtesy of Newscast, coming next.